hello and thank you for joining us for Northwest Newsweek. We're back after a short hiatus and we'll bring you stories from the past few weeks in this episode. We'll start things off at the Muscle White Gold Mine, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary. The remote mine site has produced 5 million ounces of gold since it opened in 1997. And officials are looking forward to 5 to 10 more years of production. Lee Noonan was at Muscle White for the anniversary event. The Muscle White Mine began production a quarter century ago. The mine's new general manager, Mark Kiesling, says it was that lengthy lifespan, as well as the mine's community values, that drew him to the job. 25 years ago, this mine was kind of a, a, a founding uh, operation around Indigenous partnerships. So um, we, got a, we got the Muscle White Agreement put in place, and that's gotten strong community relations. So Frank McKay is council chair and CEO of Windigo First Nations Council, which represents two of the four communities that are signatory to the Muscle White Agreement. He was present during the original negotiations. Uh, the elder, uh, late Norman Fatayash, whose treaty was that, he had a vision that this would be a good thing for for, for, for his community. McKay says jobs, training, and business opportunities at the mine have indeed benefited the local communities, but that more needs to be done to support workers and make long-term employment more viable. He also wants to see the compensation for displaced trappers updated in keeping with the cost of living. The MPP for the area, Saul Mamakwa, echoes the sentiment, saying he's here to celebrate the mine's history, but that there's always room for improvement. I see the housing conditions, uh, the, the poverty that exists within the First Nations, and uh, again, that's why I say we need to do better. We can do better. We must do better. Kiesling says community partnerships have helped the mine as well as the First Nations, saying those relationships are one high point from the mine's history, along with reaching the 5 million ounces mark and the mine's sheer longevity. Some mines don't even make it 10 years, but to have a mine with 25 years and a runway ahead of us to, to continue to produce is really fantastic and it's exciting. Um, some of the lows, uh, certainly the past few years in the, in the pandemic has been tough on the operation. Uh, and then back in, in 2019, we had a conveyor fire and that's been certainly a low. The ups and downs over the years have also included several tragedies at the mine site. We spoke to some longtime mine workers about the early days here at Muscle White. We stayed at the, we stayed at the compass tent with the plywood on the side plywood on the floor, that's how it was. When I got here, uh, there was no airport. They were just building the road. And um, there was, uh, this is kitchen number five that I've actually worked in. We got a chance to see a lot of growth and change and uh, a lot of successes and challenges. Lee Noonan, TBT News. One person has died after the plane they were piloting crashed near... Kenora on September 21st. The amateur built aircraft collided with the ground on Shore Island on Lake of the Woods. There were no other occupants and the pilot's name has not been released. Kenora OPP and the Transportation Safety Board are investigating. The TSB later confirmed that the flight originated from Minnesota. The chief of the Ojibwe's of the Omagamon First Nation was calling it racism after paramedics allegedly parked at the edge of the reserve while a man in his community died while waiting for medical help. The incident occurred on September 15th, and according to a report from APTN, one of the paramedics told Chief Jeff Kopanins that he'd been attacked on the reserve in the past. Kopanins took his outcry public, saying on Twitter, Today, a young First Nations man died in Omagamon. 911 was called. The ambulance parked at the edge of our reserve and wouldn't come help. And his family provided chest compressions. The paramedics let this young man die. This is racism. This photo allegedly shows the ambulance parked outside the community. The ambulance would fall under the jurisdiction of the Kenora District Services Board. In a written statement, CAO Henry Wall called the incident tragic, saying they will fully review what happened and have requested a Ministry of Health investigation. Minister of Indigenous Services Patty Haidu commented on Twitter saying, not being able to access urgent care is unacceptable. The investigation remains ongoing. 
A disturbing video which appears to show a police officer assaulting a First Nation man in Slate Falls earlier this month could lead to some serious repercussions for the members of the Anishinaabe Aski Police Service. NAPS officials declined to comment as the incident is now being investigated by the OPP. Mitchell Ringos reports. The cell phone video shows the NAPS officer standing over Slate Falls First Nation resident James Masakiash after it appears he was punched in the back of the head and thrown to the ground. Slate Falls is located about 150 kilometers north of Sioux Lookout. Masakiash's sister, Miriam Cook, was in another northern community at the time. She says relatives have called NAPS to bring her brother home after he had too much to drink, something NAPS officers normally do peacefully when they, um, they're they called to residence and they take them home, um, talk to the person and um, get them to go to bed. Um, I think that's their first initial step that they try to do that I've seen officers do anyway in my community. Now that did not happen this time around as the officer could be seen yelling at Masakiash saying, get yourself up or I'll drag you. He did eventually get up and stumbled forward to the police pickup truck where the situation quickly escalated. Cook later took her brother to Sioux Lookout to see a doctor amid fears of a head injury and there were visible injuries to his face. We're waiting to follow up with another doctor next week for him, uh, but psychologically he's got some stuff bothering him, I guess, with everything going on. NAPS Chief Roland Morrison has declined to comment, but in an email, NAPS has confirmed that they requested the OPP to investigate the incident and the officer in question has been placed on administrative duties. The head of the union for NAPS officers, Jason Storkson, also says he cannot comment on the incident as it's under investigation, but he does say this highlights the need for body cams for NAPS officers, who often work alone in remote communities for days on end. Cook hopes the serious repercussions will come from the OPP investigation. Our, um, our young First Nations people, from officers who use excessive force like this in the video footage, um, and I speak up on behalf of everyone who may have encountered something like this, and I'm sure there's more out there, People may be afraid to speak up. Cook adds she's not sure what's going to come out of the investigation, but says going forward her brother and family will be cooperating with the OPP, and she hopes the officer is eventually charged. Mitchell Ringos, TPT News. Large-scale power transmission projects in the province will now bring an opportunity for 50-50 First Nations equity. Hydro One recently announced that a model first used in northwestern Ontario will now be applied to all transmission projects valued over $100 million. Hydro One will partner 50-50 with First Nations on equity for all new large-scale transmission line projects. Once complete, the Wasagin transmission line will run from Thunder Bay to Dryden through Atacokan. It was the first Hydro One project to offer nearby First Nations the option to invest up to 50%. That equity model is now being applied to five new transmission projects in southwestern Ontario. Hydro One has not always gotten it right. But today, I'm proud to stand here with you all as we mark the beginning of a new path one forged an equal partnership with the original stewards of the land. We know that actions speak so much louder than words, and today we are taking one of the boldest economic reconciliation ac actions in Canada. All the previous chiefs and previous councils that worked ever since the treaty was signed, they have, they have undauntedly said we need to be partners and, and to uphold the treaty as a 50-50 partner. And I'd like to acknowledge that uh, Hydro One is making this step, this giant step, and also to make a, an example to other proponents that this has to happen. Wabagoon Lake is one of the eight First Nations that signed the Wasigan Agreement last spring. 
Another hit to the bank account is coming, this time for Enbridge gas customers here in the Northwest. The Ontario Energy Board has approved a rate increase that will take effect on October 1st. It will add about $90 a year to a typical household bill for natural gas. The market price for natural gas has increased a number of times over the past year, predominantly due to the ongoing conflict in Ukraine. Um, also, we see um, more gas that's being exported by liquefied natural gas to areas like Europe who are currently constrained and having natural gas. As a result, those prices have gone up. Stas encourages anyone who's struggling to pay their bill to reach out to the utility to arrange a payment plan. Enbridge is also asking customers to submit their own monthly meter readings, if possible. Typically, meter readings are done by employees every other month, but due to staffing challenges, that's now happening less frequently. It's forced the utility to rely more heavily on estimates based off historical usage. Those who've undertaken recent renovations in particular could be in for a surprise once Enbridge is able to do in-person readings. Have there been any changes to your consumption if you put in a pool heater? Um, if you have, uh, you know, added different appliances. Also, if you've undertaken some energy efficiency initiatives that might have reduced your gas, um, you might want to uh, think about submitting an estimate so that you can be um, uh, closer to what your, your actual use is. Stas notes all bills will be adjusted in time to reflect a customer's actual gas usage. More details are available on the Enbridge website. The name Noront Resources is no more. The mining company with a large percentage of the claims in the Ring of Fire was purchased by an Australia-based Wailu Metals in April. And the parent company has now decided to give its Canadian acquisition a new name that reflects its prime area of development. Noront will now be known as Ring of Fire Metals. Wailu officials say they highly value the rich history associated with the Ring of Fire region and its importance to Canada's critical minerals future. The company also announced plans to resume drilling and exploration activity near the site of its planned Eagle's Nest mine. 44 new employees have been hired, with half of them coming from Martin Falls, Webequay, Arrowland and Iskandika First Nations. Officials with Noront Resources spent around 20 years exploring and assessing the Eagle's Nest deposit, which is rich in nickel, copper, platinum and palladium. Wailu officials say they plan to upgrade the work site as the future mine gets closer to development. Coming up after the break, we've got a look at a new docu-series focusing on the Great Lakes, which includes some unique aspects of this region.